Okay, any questions about last class? I know there are some questions on Slack that I have pinned. So if you asked a question on Slack and it has been pinned, it means it's on my list. Either you asked a question which is too difficult for me that I need to think about, which happens once in a while, or I've just been not able to get to it, but I will get to it. And if I don't, and you're really getting anxious because you want an answer, just write a message in, in a reply to that thread and say, where is my answer? And I will try to get to it earlier. Otherwise, I'll, I'll make sure that I get to everything soon. So, <clears throat> any questions? All right, let's resume our conversation about phase boundary. What can we really say about the boundary between two phases? So I will recapitulate some of what I did from the last class and then continue from there. It won't be in as much detail as the last class, but I will capture uh, the, uh, the repeated stuff I will, I will capture. So let's say we have a pressure temperature phase diagram and let's say we are interested in the coexistence between a phase alpha and a phase beta. What does coexistence mean? It means that along this line, you have go, you are going to have alpha and beta both existing at the same time. And what we want to characterize, what is this line? Why does it look like this? What is, what is the equation covering this line? Because if we know that, then that's a very powerful tool. We know how to control the coexistence of these two phases and, and many other things. So in, for this, we focused on two points, point A and point B. Here, I'm drawing them really far apart from each other just for clarity, but otherwise these points are very close with respect to each other. So this is our phase alpha, this is our phase beta, and coexistence along the line of alpha plus beta. It's a one component system. So how do we know that alpha plus beta will coexist along a line? It's a one component system. You can use your Gibbs rule, F is equal to C minus P plus two. If you do F is equal to C minus P plus two for a one component system where you have two phases, so one minus two plus two is equal to one or one degree of freedom. Hence the line is one degree of, hence the coexistence is one degree of freedom. If you had a two component system, the coexistence region would have been uh, two degree of freedom. It would have been uh, two, it would have been not a line, but an area. And, but then we won't be able to draw it in a plot like this. A two component phase diagram is drawn in a triangle, which is called a Gibbs triangle. If I have time, I will get to it later. Gibbs triangle for two component. So that, that's for later if, if you have time, but if, if, you don't, if you don't get to that, that's, that's okay for this semester. So we have two points A and B, and we are saying that the system is in equilibrium. The phase alpha is in equilibrium with phase beta at point E, they coexist, and they also coexist at point B. They coexist together at points A and at point B. So let's say this temperature difference is dt, and this pressure difference is dp. So what we can say here is that the chemical potential of mu in phase alpha as a function of pressure and temperature is equal to chemical potential of mu, chemical potential of phase beta as a function of pressure and temperature at A. And also the same equation applies at B. Therefore, we can say that the chemical potential of the phase alpha must have changed by the same amount. So during this process, if the chemical potential changes by mu, d, let's say it changes by d mu beta for the phase beta, and let's say it changes by d mu alpha for the phase alpha, this change must be the same, right? Because here you were mu, mu alpha is equal to mu beta, and now you're saying that here as well, mu alpha is equal to mu beta. Well, the only way that is possible is that both of them change by the same amount, right? So therefore d mu alpha is equal to d mu beta. And remember, we are working with a one component system, therefore we can change mu with g. If it was not, one component, then life would be more complicated, right? Because for one component system, G is equal to mu n. If it was a two component system, then it would have been G is equal to mu one n one plus mu two n two and life would be more complicated. 
but since we have one component, we can directly use g is equal to mu m. So this means that dg of phase alpha is equal to dg of phase beta. And at any point, if something is not clear or you just want me to stop and explain something again, just, just say it, okay? I, have, uh, I would love if you do that. There's no point in me just racing. So this means that the Gibbs free energy of alpha and the Gibbs free energy of beta must have changed by the same amount as we move from point A to point B. Now, what do we know about dg? dg is equal to vdp minus sdt, and it's a one component system. So, and the number is not changing. So the third term here, the summation i mu i d and i term does not matter. That goes to zero because first of all, it's a one component system. So d and i, d in one is constant. You're not changing the number. So, so dg is equal to vdp minus sdt. So if we take this as equation number one and we take this as equation number two and use two and one, we get dg of alpha, which means V of phase alpha multiplied by pressure dp minus entropy of phase alpha multiplied by temperature dt should be equal to V of phase beta multiplied by temperature dp minus entropy of phase beta multiplied by temperature dt. Or so you might, one question that you should be asking at this point is which volume are you calculating? Are you calculating the volume at point A or at point B? So this is a Taylor series type of argument. It doesn't make much of a difference where you are calculating the volume. You could assume that you are calculating it at point A, for example. So we, because the thing that really matters here is, matters here is V alpha minus V beta. So we get V alpha minus V beta dp is equal to V beta min V alpha minus V beta dp is equal to S alpha minus S beta dt. Did I get it right? S alpha minus S beta. Yeah. All right. Or dp by dt is equal to V alpha minus V beta. I'm doing the same mistake again that I did last time. How is it even possible? This is equal to S alpha minus S beta by V alpha minus V beta. You could have also written it as S. Uh, let me open the chat. Can you repeat what you said about the temperature calculation? What did I say about temperature calculation? I didn't say about temperature calculation. What I said about is this V alpha. Is it V alpha at point A? Or is it V alpha at point B? How do we know? Right? I have not specified that. What I'm saying is it doesn't matter because what really matters is the difference between V alpha and V beta. So it's, it, it is at some point along the line. It's, it's an arbitrary location along the line. This calculation could have been done at A. You could have started this calculation and done it at B. It doesn't matter. That, that's what I was saying. Or this is delta S during the phase transition, delta transition S by delta transition V. And this equation is quite important. It is called the Clepron equation. In order to derive it, we did not make any assumptions regarding the nature of interaction of the species that is undergoing the phase transition, right? We did not say it's an ideal gas or a Van der Waals gas or anything like that. It's really simple, like two lines, three lines of derivation applicable to phase transitions at equilibrium. And it's really general, it's really powerful. So let's use this to look at three classes of phase, trans phase transition, which are the most common. We will use this to look at solid to liquid phase transition, liquid to gas phase transition, and solid to gas phase transition, 
last, last time we started looking at the solid to liquid, I did it in a slightly rushed manner. I'm going to go through it again. And that's where I will show you why ice skating is not an example of localized melting. And on the Slack later, I will post some very recent research articles which actually go into why it happens. And the, yeah, it's, it's still an open question, I think, apparently, as to how does ice skating really work. People are still arguing over it. So first, let's look at the solid to liquid phase transition. So in this case, so what are we going to do? We are going to directly apply our Clapeyron equation and see what it tells us. Let me move this chat window to the side. So Clapeyron equation tells us that dP by dt is equal to delta. In this case, we are going to call it fusion, the solid to liquid fusion or melting, whatever you want. Either way, it's the same thing. It's in just opposite direction, right? So we will call it fusion. That's a typical nomenclature. So delta change in entropy during fusion divided by change in volume during fusion. Now, if you recall in the past, we have studied that delta S in general is delta Q reversible by temperature. Right, this, uh, or let's call it as ds, because we have ds is equal to delta q reversible by temperature. That was our definition of ds, right? So if it's a constant pressure process, because that's what we are interested in, this is going to be dh by t, right? Recall, this is first law, when, when should we use ds and delta s? Delta s, it doesn't really matter. If you just use delta S over here, that's okay. We, we won't be uh, deducting your points. Typically, both D and delta, you could have called it as delta S or DS. It's the same thing. You want to stay consistent. If you can have delta one side and delta the other side, that's best. So for example, I could have written delta S is equal to delta Q by T. That's fine because delta on its own regarding Q does not tell us whether it's a path function or state function. But if I use say, all, all of these as delta, right? But this squiggly delta that I have with Q tells us it's a path function. So it's, and the other thing about this delta is it can apply to long changes also, right? Not just small, tiny changes. So this one typically always applies to small changes or big changes, while this one or this one applies only to small changes, right? That's, that's the take home now. And this applies to large, or small, nothing stopping you. You can do it for either. But that's just nomenclature. So we know ds is equal to dh by t. So in this case, this becomes delta fusion h, the change in enthalpy during the fusion process, divided by the temperature at which your fusion or melting is happening, divided by the volume change during fusion. And I'm going to write, in as, write it as delta fuse H by temperature, delta fuse V. So this is our dP by dt for a solid liquid phase transition in general. So for most substances, delta fusion H is more than zero. Does this make sense? It does, right? In order to melt something, you have to give heat to it, except one substance. That is a very peculiar substance. It's called helium-3. At very close to zero Kelvin, very close to absolute zero, helium becomes a super, super, uh, super fluid. And in that case, funky quantum mechanics starts to play a role. And in order to melt it, you don't give heat, but you actually extract heat in order to melt it, which is really strange quantum mechanical behavior. Maybe you will study about it in 482. We are not going to talk about that here, but it's okay to assume that for almost everything we know, delta fusion H, the change in enthalpy during fusion is positive. You have to give heat to the system in order to melt it. And delta fusion volume is also typically more than zero. Most things, when they melt, they expand, right? When you melt 
something, it typically takes up more volume, except water. Except water. For water, delta fuse V is negative. Water, when ice when ice melts, or uh, in the, let's not talk about ice melt. Ice is lighter than water. And as you know, you know, ice floats on top of water. It does not go and sink. I mean, this is the reason why uh, organisms can exist in frozen lakes. If this was not true, the whole lake would have frozen or things like that, right? But ice, when it floats, it comes to the top and you can have fish or things like that. Maybe some of you have been uh, ice fishing and things like that. Yeah, this is kind of cool. So ice is lighter than water and that's for, for water delta fuse volume is less than zero so what does this mean for almost for most of these materials or chemicals that we know both of these are positive therefore dp by dt is positive for almost everything in fact you can say let we'll get to water in a moment in fact you can say that V liquid tends to be so much more than V solid for most materials. When it melts, the change in volume is quite high. Therefore, dP by dt is not just positive, but, oh, sorry, I, this is, we are not talking about gas, so my bad. When we go to gas, we know that V gas is much more than V liquid and V gas is much more than V solid. But remember when we were looking at the comparison between internal energy and enthalpy for a system, we said if the system is entirely liquid or some liquid and some solid, it is okay to approximate enthalpy by internal energy. There the idea was that while V liquid is more than V solid, it is not tremendously more. It is kind of in the same area. When a liquid becomes a gas, the change in volume is enormous. When a solid sublimates and becomes gas, the change in volume is enormous. But when a solid becomes liquid, the change in volume is not enormous, maybe 5%, maybe 10%. It's not preposterous. In fact, for ice and water, it's the other direction. So what does this mean? This means that V delta V fusion is positive, but kind of close to zero. It's not much larger than zero. What does this tell us about dp by dt? dp by dt has delta V fusion in the denominator, right? So therefore dp by dt is a large positive number, right? Because the denominator is so small for almost everything and a large negative number for water, and I'm not gonna go into helium-3 here. Large negative number for water. We can draw this, we are talking about the slope, right? So if we draw our pressure temperature phase diagram, and here we are talking about the coexistence between solid and liquid, dp by dt is large, the slope is large. What does that mean? If the slope is, and let's ignore water for a bit, does it mean dp by dt is going to look like this? Or does it mean dp by dt is going to look like this? Which one is more correct? And here we are talking about solid and liquid coexistence. Which curve is more correct, A or B? Given that dp by dt is large positive. Any ideas? Which one should it be? You can just type in chat, A. Good, thanks Matt. Anyone thinks it's B? If you think it's B, then try to tell me why. And I will try to explain to you why not. As you can see, right? This curve has a higher slope. That's the property of a slope. In fact, the y-axis has a slope of infinity, right? The x-axis has a slope of zero. 
So we can say this is not true. The curve that is going to be applicable is this one with a very, very high slope. In fact, for most materials, it's, it tends to be almost vertical. The difference is not a lot at all. For everything, for nearly everything, for water, it's going to look, again, a steep line, but it will look like this, solid and liquid, because now the slope is negative. Right, so dp by dt now has a negative slope. So this is how our solid liquid line looks for water. We can find an equation for this line. How do we do that for any, any material, not just, water, not just the top one or water, but for any generic material, we can try to write down the full equation because here we have just written the slope. So how do we do that? We have dp by dt, so equation for the P as a function of T curve for solid liquid coexistence. Let's do that. So we have dP by dT is equal to delta fusion H by temperature delta fusion V, right? So let's put dP on the left side and let's put everything else on the right side and make an assumption that delta fusion H and delta fusion volume are temperature independent, which is not the best assumption because these things will depend on temperatures. If, if they really depend on temperature, then you will have to put them inside the integral and your life will be more complicated. So let's, assuming, assuming these are, so that's an assumption assuming these are independent of temperature. So, and this is where you can see we are, we are now getting a bit weaker because when we derived our Clapeyron equation over here, this one was really assumption free, except equilibrium, that's fine. We are talking about thermodynamics where things are in equilibrium, thermodynamic equilibrium exists. So, so this is really assumption free. But this one is a big assumption. We are assuming that delta fusion edge and delta assuming both numerator and denominator are independent of uh, temperature. So, and let's say this means going from pressure P1 to P2. So let's say we are talking, let's say we are talking about some pressure P1 and some pressure P2, and we want to connect both of them. So here I drew a straight line because it's a small part, but in general, it's going to be a curve. So how do we do that? Now we can say therefore P2 minus P1 is equal to delta fusion H by delta fusion V ln of T2 by T1. That's our equation. That tells us the change in pressure as we change the temperature. If this one was T1, and this one was at T2. And this could also apply to this curve over here. If this was P1 and P2, this could have been T1 and this could have been T2. If you know the value, you can go and tell the change in pressure. Or if you know the value of the pressure, you can go and tell the change in temperature. Okay. Before we move into liquid to gas and solid to gas phase transitions, Will we have to deal with a situation where we assume both are independent of temperature? Oh, Elizabeth wants me to design an exam problem for you. Yes, sure, Elizabeth, I can make such an exam problem. It will be just math. There will be nothing funky. You, know, you will have some expression. But if you go and apply this, I don't know, if, you, if you're going to work in a biochemistry lab at, or at FDA or NIH or somewhere, and you have a protein that you have done experiments on, most of the times for real materials, it won't be the case. But you won't have this nice ln T2 by T1 expression holding, but it, the, the, the science behind the problem is no longer complicated. You know how to deal with it. It's just that instead of integrating dT by T, you have to integrate, it, integrate dT by T multiplied by something else, which is a function of temperature. So it's just a question of a bit more complicated integration. And hopefully you will have a computer doing the integration for you and you won't be doing it by hand. So it will be simpler. 
Okay, great. So let's, before we go into these other two, liquid to gas and solid to gas, let's talk about ice skating and how does that work. So for ice skating, we have to focus on the phase diagram for water, right? One of the things we just showed that in the phase diagram for water, in the pressure temperature curve, the solid liquid line is facing towards right. The slope is negative. Now it should be clear to all of you why that is happening. We haven't talked about the behavior of this curve, which is the liquid vapor line. As you can see, one of the things that's happening here is that the slope is a bit weaker. It's not as sharp. I have brought the slope down. I did not draw it as something like this, right? I have brought the slope down. In fact, it might be even further down. And you will see why that is the case. And similarly, we will see why there is a third curve with a similar slope, which is the solid and vapor coexistence point. So this one is called the triple point. And this is the critical point. We will be talking about the critical point this week in a bit of detail at which the critical point is a very funky point at which you cannot distinguish between liquid and vapor. The surface tension entirely disappears. So you, you just can't tell whether it's liquid or it's vapor. It it's all looks the same. But right now we are not interested in the triple point or the critical point. We are interested in something very specific. We are interested in this part of the phase diagram, the solid liquid part of the phase diagram. So let me talk, let me put the title here ice skating uh, unexplained because I'm not going to show you how it works. I'm going to show you how it does not work, how what you thought about it, which was even I was taught in high school or earlier is actually wrong. So in order to do this, let's say this is our zero degree Celsius line. And if you have ice skated, you know the rink is not at zero degrees Celsius, right? You're typically slightly below freezing. If you're going to be at zero degrees Celsius, it won't be ice. It will be, uh, it will just be water everywhere. So typical temperature of an ice skating rink tends to be around minus seven degrees Celsius. It's a bit below zero degrees Celsius. Typically it's a bit lower. So at minus seven degrees Celsius, let's say this is our one bar atmospheric pressure. This is where we should be, right? So at minus seven degrees Celsius at one bar, we are going to be in deep in the solid region, right? Ice skating won't work because it's just solid ice. So the idea is that we apply some pressure on the ice thereby your skates with very sharp things that you are going to apply. And you apply so much pressure that you move up and go and touch this line, the solid liquid coexistence line. And that's when the ice would melt, right? So we want to calculate that. We want to calculate this delta P that will roughly correspond to this delta T of seven degrees Celsius. That's what we want to calculate. If instead of minus seven degrees Celsius, we were further deeper in, if let's say we were over here, one bar at minus 14 degrees Celsius, you can see the amount of pressure you need to apply will be even higher, right? It will go up even more. And you know why it will go up a lot. Why will it go up a lot? Because this black curve is really steep, right? It rises very, very steeply. So if you are at minus 14 degrees Celsius, the amount of pressure that you need to apply to get up to the solid liquid coexistence is going to be even, oh yeah, really low. Well, 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 good point. Again, Zach, good question. I'm not explaining how ice skating works, right? So I'm just going to show you that at minus seven degrees Celsius, where ice skating is actually done in the rinks, this delta p is going to be a huge number. So it might work at minus 14 degrees Celsius also, but it won't be through the localized melting argument. And we will get to that. I will post some articles on why it might work. So I'm not ruling that out. What I'm ruling out is that, what I'm gonna rule out is that minus seven degrees Celsius, it's not going to be localized melting. I will show you this delta p is going to be so high. And you can see why it's going to be so high. You already have a sense for it. The reason it will be high 
is because the solid liquid coexistence curve for water rises extremely sharply. If it was a curve that went back up like this or this, maybe you had a chance. But as we saw, the delta P by delta T rises so much higher that it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be problematic. There is another question. Does delta T extend to zero degrees Celsius or the curve? Good question, Yunju and Caitlin. Who wants to answer it? That's a very good question. Does the delta T exist to zero degree Celsius or the curve? Anyone wants to answer that? And it's a good question. Caitlin, you said it happens to line up. That's correct. Why? You can unmute yourself. I'm honestly not sure why. I was also confused. I was answering based on the picture. So the reason why is because at one bar, what is the temperature at which ice and water coexist? It is zero degrees Celsius, right? It is the melting point. Hence, they have to line up. That's why I said it's wonderful. It has to line up because it is the temperature at which they coexist. Phase diagrams are fun. Type two. Okay. So now we have to calculate this delta P. So in order to do this, we cannot just do it by hand. I will provide you some numerical values. So our delta P by delta T, again, by Clapeyron equation is going to be delta S by delta V, which is going to be the latent heat of fusion. So L is the latent heat of fusion, which we saw, we wrote it as delta H in the previous thing. People call it L, same thing, divided by temperature, divided by delta volume. You'll be like, oh no, what do I do with temperature? I have zero degrees Celsius, everything blows up. No, temperature should be used in Kelvin, be careful. L for ice, and I'm providing the number here, this is an experiment that you can perform, is around 3.34 into 10 to the power 5 joules per kg. And again, the numbers will make everything concrete but the answer should already be obvious to you the answer really follows from the fact that this solid liquid line is very steep up as soon as you go slightly into the temperature to the left the amount of pressure that you have to increase to meet the solid liquid line just blows up exponentially it really goes up very high and uh, yeah cool so we have L is equal to this much. Delta V for water around zero degrees Celsius tends to be negative, right? Because when you melt, the volume goes down. Ice has ice is lighter than water, so ice has more volume. So delta V is minus 9.05 into 10 to the power minus 5 meter cube per kg. If you put this in delta P by delta T, and you might ask what value of temperature to use, should I use zero degrees Celsius or minus six, seven degrees Celsius? It doesn't really matter for this answer. I will just, because it's the number we are looking at is order of magnitude. I would use uh, minus seven degrees Celsius, which is uh, 286. So this would be L we have here divided by something like 286 Kelvin multiplied by the delta V that we have over here. And this comes out to be minus 13.5 megapascal per Kelvin. Or for delta T is equal to seven Kelvin, which is the change that you want to make, delta P should be equal to around 100 megapascal. That's a huge, huge, huge number. That's an enormous, enormous number. And uh, I can come up with many analogies for this, but the best one in my head is, you know, like a, uh, like a big, big elephant in ballerina shoes or on a guitar pick, you know, something like that. And uh, it's, it's, it is, this is not the amount of pressure your ice skates are exerting. You can check in your weight, depending on wherever it is, but I'm quite confident that none of us is heavy enough to exert this much pressure in ice skating. Therefore, ice skating 
localized melting argument is fake news. It's not true. Why it works? That's complicated. I have a friend at UC Berkeley. His name is David Limmer. He's a physical chemist. He's, he's in the same age group as me. He started a couple of, a few years ago. He has a paper in Scientific American, which I can, or, or somewhere else, where he talks about that the most agreed upon explanation right now is that you form a nanostructured film of water on the top of ice. It's not melting. Something else happens. You kind of break you kind of disrupt the chain of the molecules, the water molecules in ice that connect to each other. You disrupt that chain in a very nano layer and you lead to formation of a nanofilm. And that's what leads to skating. So I will send that article on Slack, but that's why I said this is unexplained. Most of, the, most of you probably thought this is correct, but it's not, as you can see. Good, any questions about this? Okay, good. So, so we have just, uh, how did I get T is equal to 286 Kelvin? How did I get it? It's minus seven degrees Celsius, right? 286 is minus seven degrees Celsius. Like I said, you could have used 293 Kelvin at zero degrees Celsius. It wouldn't have changed this 100 megapascal number, right? I kind of just approximated it. So around, around 293 Kelvin, a bit lower if you were doing it at so th that's not the main number here. The main number here is that delta volume. The reason why this really happened is because this thing is a small number. It's negative, but it's a small number. The denominator has a number close to zero. Hence the thing delta P by delta T blows up. Does that make sense, Noel? So many of you asked about it. You, you can just put in 293. The level of approximation that I did here to multiply it by seven, 13.5 multiplied by seven is not 100, it's something else. Yeah, whole point. You do zero. Oh, is it 273, cousin? Oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry. I need some coffee. Sorry. Sorry about that. That's why everyone was getting pissed off. Is it? Oh, yeah, that is true. Doesn't matter. Our argument is still 100 megapascal. That's where we stand, okay? It's a, it's a back of the envelope calculation. So with 266, you will get around 13.5 megapascal or 13 megapascal per Kelvin. And, uh, oh yeah, terrible. When I have that? a question. Go ahead. So, um, I don't know if you would give us a problem like this where we have to calculate, you know, uh, delta P and delta C, but if we did, would we use, you know, the top number like minus seven or zero? Cause in this case you just chose minus seven and you said that it didn't really make make a difference good point so there is going to be that is the first problem on the homework this week is related to this so that will help you answer your question how about that okay and if you get really confused like no now i don't know how to solve this problem then come and ask us okay but uh, the, the thing to keep in mind is that this change, the, we really derived it in a differential form, dp by dt. What does that mean? dp by dt differential means that the dt should be small. We are not talking about large changes in temperature, correct? If you're not talking about large changes in temperature, that t1 and t2 are going to be the same. If you're talking about the large changes in temperature, then you have to use this integrated form. That's the answer here. Since we are going to use this to talk about small changes in temperature, the error that you will make by changing something in the denominator will be, will, for construction, has to be less than a few percentage points. Okay? Could friction slightly increase T and decrease dP? Oh, that's not going to friction. Friction is the beast of non-equilibrium. In a perfectly equilibrium world, there will be no friction. Friction and dissipation are the beasts of non-equilibrium. So uh, please remind me to post the article on Slack later after the class. Don't remind me right now because then I won't see it. I will post that article there. You will see friction also plays a role. 
yeah, it, it's, 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 it's still not, I don't think it's completely clear as to how it has worked. People are still arguing over it. Okay, great. So yeah, so to answer Noel's question, this, this temperature, you could take the top one or the bottom one, the, and to be very clear, to be very precise, you should actually take the middle one to really talk about it. But it doesn't matter because you're talking about a small delta t. If you don't have a small delta t, you shouldn't be using the differential form of the equation anyway. You should be using the integrated form of the equation. So integrated form, let me make this clear here. Integrated form is useful when t2 minus t1 is large. Okay, that's the whole thing about differential form versus integrated forms. You use one when the change is small. Differential form you use when the change is small. Okay, let's go to liquid vapor boundary. So we did solid liquid. Now let's talk about liquid vapor boundary. So in this case, again, we will have dp by dt is equal to delta vaporization h divided by temperature divided by delta vaporization volume, right? So delta S has been replaced by delta vaporization H by T. Once again, for almost all materials, I don't think I know of a counter example, delta vap H is positive. You have to give heat in order to vaporize something. Also, delta vap V is much more than zero. Unlike the previous case where the solid liquid change in volume is positive most of the times, but or sometimes negative, like for water, but it is kind of close to zero. Here, V vapor minus V liquid tends to be much more than zero. For almost anything, the vapor tends to have a much more volume than the liquid. What does this mean for our equation? This means that dP by dt will still be positive, but the slope will be smaller. than for solid liquid. Why will it be smaller? Because for solid liquid, when we were dividing by delta fusion volume, that was a very small number, right? When you divide by a very small number, you get a very large number. Here we are dividing by this number, which is very large. When you divide by a very large number, you tend to get a small number, right? So dP by dt is also positive, but it is less so than solid liquid. So how, let's go to our phase diagram where we had drawn a line and I'm going to ignore water for now. We had drawn the line for solid, li for solid liquid which looked something like this, right? Solid liquid. And now I'm talking about liquid vapor. Liquid vapor is going to look something like this. It, will, it also has positive slope, but this slope, slope difference is the thing you really need to keep in mind here. And it came from a very physical reason that delta VAP V is much more than delta fusion V, okay? So we can again try, so this is again for differential changes. So to, going back to the question Noel and others ask which temperature to use here, doesn't matter much because it's the differential change. If you're talking about integrated changes where the temperature varies a lot, in other words, how about the pressure temperature curve for liquid vapor coexistence? What can we say about this? We make another assumption here. Last time we made an assumption that delta, we made assumptions that delta fusion H and delta fusion V are independent of temperature. Here we again make the assumption of perfect gas. Assume that vapor is perfect gas. It's a huge, terrible, not terrible, it's a big assumption, right? Why would it be vapor gas, uh, a perfect gas? But let's say it's a perfect gas to derive an equation. Let's assume that vapor is perfect gas. In this case, we can say that the V gas is equal to RT by P. And even though I'm doing it here for perfect gas, hopefully you will see that you could have done it for some other equation of state. Maybe to the reason why I'm doing it this way is because if you follow this, then if you did have some complicated equation of state that you got from experiments, you could still repeat the calculation, nothing would change. Therefore, delta VAP V is equal to 
V gas minus V liquid and I will approximate it as V gas. Why can I do this? Because V liquid is much smaller than V gas. In turn is RT by P. Therefore, dP by dt, I should start numbering my equations more. What was the last number? I don't know what it was. I will just call it equation number four. Therefore, from four and five, where this is equation number five, we get dP by dt is equal to delta VAP H by temperature divided by delta VAP V. What is that? That is RT by P. So this becomes P over RT, right? So this thing looks like P delta VAP H by RT square. So DP is equal to DT multiplied DP by, uh, or DP is equal to this. Therefore, DP by P is equal to delta VAP H by R dt by dt square. So it's a different integral now, right? When we start to integrate it, last time we had integrated dt by t, but now for this, this was true for the uh, integrated form, assuming delta fusion H and delta fusion volume are independent of temperature, came from integrated dt by t. Here it's going to come from integrating dt by t square. So this will be p1, p2 t1, t2, and once you do this integral, you can get the equation just like you did last time, but already this equation is quite useful. You can write it in the following form. You can write it as d ln p, right? dp by p is d ln p by dt is equal to delta vap h by rt squared. This is the form in which you will see this equation quite occasionally, quite frequently, and it has a name. The name can be a bit confusing because it's so similar to Clapeyron equation. This one is called Clausius-Clapeyron equation. Clausius-Clapeyron equation, therefore, is an approximate form and I want to highlight this, this is much more approximate, approximate than Clapeyron equation. The Clapeyron equation, we assume nothing. For Clausius Clapeyron equation, we have assumed that, we have made one big assumption really. We, we have made two big assumptions. We have assumed that V gas is so much more than V liquid that V liquid can completely be ignored. And secondly, we have assumed, so this is assumption number one. And this is assumption number two. On top of that, we have assumed, so first we assume that V gas is much more than V liquid. And on top of that, we assume that V gas is given, that, given by that of an ideal gas. If we do that, we get this closest electron equation applicable to liquid vapor transitions. Clausius equation, however, was applicable to solid, liquid, liquid vapor, vapor, liquid, anything, all types of transitions. And uh, next time we will talk about the solid vapor boundary, which is again, very simple, or let, let me just finish this because it is so, so short dp by dt is equal to delta sublimation now divided by t delta sublimation volume here once again delta sublimation volume is going to be much more than zero why because v gas is so much more than v solid and in general delta sublimation h is also positive therefore dp by dt is positive and a small number. Why is it a small number? Because the denominator is such a large number, more than zero. So finally, we can draw our all three curves here. We have pressure temperature. We showed that solid liquid is kind of steep 
and positive except water. Liquid vapor looks something like this. It is less steep and solid vapor will also be similar steepness to solid to liquid vapor and it will look something like this. So this, this is our solid plus vapor coexistence. This is our liquid plus solid coexistence. And this is our liquid plus vapor coexistence. Next time, we are going to talk about this very peculiar point called the, triple, the critical point. And uh, I also want to highlight that this would be true for water. This would be true for everything else. Next time, we will talk about triple point of water, or, or triple, uh, sorry, critical point. And uh, then we will move on to solutions. We won't be talking about more complicated phase diagrams than this because we have lots of concepts to cover. And no office hour for me today. Connor will be doing his office hour tomorrow. And there will be a new homework due on Wednesday morning. Uh, there will be new homework released on Wednesday morning. Okay, and you can ask me questions on Slack. I will be holding office hours.